series entitled The Desert Lessons. And it has been a very dirty, a very dusty lesson. And we are on the third installment of Quails and Manor. And this will be the last installment for this particular topic, Quails and Manor. Now, friends, our thematic text for this series is Romans chapter 15, verse 4. And the Apostle Paul admonishes us that what, whatsoever things are written aforetime, written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. And friends, we do need some hope. We have come to a very critical point in Earth's history where there's so much sadness in the world today, and we do need hope, not just the hope that man can give or government can give, the hope even in the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our thematic quote for this series has been taken from the book Testimonies to Ministers, Ministers page 31. Some of the Lord says that we as a people, we have nothing to fear for the future, except we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teachings in our past history. And as, as happens, we, ha we have a very rich, very rich history. We have been admonished, friends, that we should you know, throughout the week, at least once per week, revisit Psalms 105, 106, and 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Why? Because these three chapters, they rehearse the history of ancient Israel, their plight as they left Egypt and as they made their way to the land of Canaan. Friends, when they came out of Egypt, as they went into the wilderness, God promised them in Exodus, quick revision in Exodus 15, 26, that if they were diligent and they would do that which was right in his sight and they would keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments and ordinances god promised that he would put none of the diseases that he put upon the egyptian for he is the lord that healeth them and we learned that the egyptians had some diseases that took their lives prematurely in the book of deuteronomy 28, 17, Moses told us that they suffered from the botch and from the emeroids, Lizzie, and from the scab, Nathan, from the itch and from the astonishment of the heart. These are the same diseases that are plaguing society today, friends. As a matter of fact, scientists and archaeologists have actually excavated the bodies of mummies and they have deduced from pure, pure science that the Egyptians suffered, yea, from heart disease. They suffered from cancer and from arthritis, <coughs> pardon me, from diabetes, from obesity, from high blood pressure, and from rheumatism, and even from sexually transmitted disease. Yea, friends, these things were attributed to a lifestyle. We want to reason from cause to effect, and I would affirm that the cure is always in the cause. As they came in the wilderness, God now, the God of Israel, Jehovah, was now trying to introduce a plan, not a new plan, but a plan which they had forgotten while they were in Egypt, of health reform. And health reform is a very broad topic. It covers getting enough sunlight, plenty of exercise. And friends, I want to encourage you guys, this is uh, this is uh, uh, this is one which we are we are very uh, negligent in. We need to do our best to get our children out there, friends. We need to exercise at least twenty minutes per day, yay, six days a week. It does stimulate the blood flow. It does strengthen the muscles, muscles and the sinews, friends. It does tone the body, friends. It works the heart, the lungs. It causes the blood to flow, brothers and sisters. Jesus walked everywhere he went. Right? Plenty of rest. We encourage you guys to get to bed before 10 o'clock. It does add one hour to your rest. Right? It also includes get plenty of fresh air, plenty of water, trust in God, and above all, temperance, which teaches us to abstain entirely from that which is injurious and use judiciously that which is good. And then it also includes diet. Right, We learned when they left Egypt, we're told that the controlling power of appetite will prove to be the ruin of thousands. When if they had conquered on this point, they would have the moral power to gain the victory over every other temptation. But those who are slaves to appetite will fail in perfecting Christian character. And as we near the close of time, brothers and sisters, Satan's temptation to indulge in appetite will become more powerful and more difficult to overcome. And as we are steering 
the mark of the beast crisis when no man can buy and sell. Friends, if we have not curved our appetite, we will sell our soul for Kentucky Fried Chicken. You're not hearing me. 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says, Whatsoever you eat or drink, whatsoever you do, we must do all to the glory of God. Therefore, we've learned that health reform is a very broad, very vast subject. That word whatever is inclusive. It includes exercise and recreation, rest, sleep, yea, even dress. And we're going to talk about dress reform. And there's a style of dress today that is pervasive among God's people, which is inappropriate. While health reform is closely linked to our spiritual life, it is not the gospel. Health is not the gospel. Rather, health is a part of the gospel. So as they came out of Egypt, friends, there was one area of, their, of health reform which God attacked aggressively. It's almost like when there is cancer, you have to attack that thing aggressively. He attacked the area of diet. And as it was in the type, so it is in the anti-type. Friends, once you embrace Jesus and this Adventist message, the first area in your life which Jesus will seek to get on the control is your appetite. He will now seek to bring you back to that which is helpful. We learned, friend, that there was, they had their Jehovah and Jehovah Jireh and Rafa and Nisi and uh, Medikeshim and Roho and Shalom. But the Jehovah that we focused on was a Jehovah Jared, my provider. And as they were in the wilderness, friends, God now sought to provide for them that which was helpful. And we learned now that the state of the mind, you want to read for me, read for me please? The state of the mind? Mm -hmm. The state of the mind has largely to do with the health of the body, and especially with the health of the digestive organs. As a general thing, the Lord did not provide his people with flesh meat in the desert, because he knew that the use of this diet would, inc would create disease and insubordination. Friends, you got to get that, friends. That Egyptian diet produced disease of numerous kinds. And, when, and in those diseases, they found other diseases. But it also produced insubordination. That word insubordination is a big word to unbelief. Hebrews 11 verse 3. And friends, we, are, we have come to a point now where if insubordination is all through the ranks of Seventh-day Adventism. Friends. It is in leadership. It is in local churches. It is in even in home. We are a rebellious people. And attributed to rebelliousness, is, our, is the appetite, friends. Please read now, she says. In order to modify the disposition and bring the higher powers of the mind into active exercise, he removed from them the flesh of dead animals. He gave them angels' food, manna from heaven. So friends, here we see, friends, what, 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 what the Egyptian diet does, it causes the higher powers of the mind to go to sleep. That's what it does. And so when God now removed that, it woke them up. So what God gave them manna, friends. And we learned, we learned last Lord's Day that the anti-type for manna is a plant-based diet. Friends, you can't go wrong with this diet. A diet co consists of fruits, nuts, grains, and vegetables not cooked to submission, veg which are crunchy. As a matter of fact, I remember one time, man, I, 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 went, and I, I went to a place called... Uh, Piccadilly, uh, Piccadilly, and boy, they had some, some greens, and those greens, boy, was sub in submission. Lord have mercy, but so our greens must be crunchy and lively, lively, steam, not just depressed, right? And so here we see, friends, the anti-type, and we know now, friends, that in 1863, this is a critical date for us. The Lord, it was when our church was established, Ali. We were, that's, that's our birth date, 1863. And that was the day also that Ellen White was given the uh, one of the most comprehensive vision in regards to health reform. I'm going to show you a video. I hope you all can hear it. If the mic can get it right. Mm -hmm. Well, let me see. All right, let, 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 me, let me back it up. All right. As Ellen White sought to understand what the disappointment meant, she had visions. Over her lifetime, 
She is said to have had 2,000 visions, which Adventists believe Hope you can hear it. directly from God. Those visions would help chart a course for the new church. She would often faint on the floor. They'd put a pillow under her head, and she would be seemingly out of it. They would test, and they couldn't see that she was breathing. And then she would come out of these and start saying what she had seen. In 1863, she had what is known in, in my circles as the comprehensive health vision that outlined a deeper commitment and to bodily health and an understanding of the close relationship between bodily health and spiritual wholeness. This vision on health was actually quite encompassing. It talked about a plant-based diet, it talked about the need for sunshine, about the need for exercise, cleanliness, about the need of reducing sugar and increasing uh, vegetables and fibers in the, in the diet. But for those early Adventists, this was a major lifestyle change. And even for Ellen White, I mean, her favorite food was meat and white bread. All right, so here we have friends. So you can probably see that video on YouTube also, right? But friends, then that's the website, right? So here we see, friends, that this issue of, of health reform is not something for us to take lightly. God gave it to her, and we learned, we left off last Sabbath that we're told that God now wants to wake the minds up in regards to health. Friends, and most of God's people are sleeping, friends, in regards to this issue, this issue of, of health. And, and why, why must the Rastafarians be the ones who are champion uh, a plant-based diet? Why must the Buddhists and these new ages? What's wrong with God's people? Why is it we're the last one to get on board, friends? And there are people today who are bucking, who are fighting health reform, and don't know they are fighting against God. And I told you you can't win because your arms are too short. A part of our message is to wake up the world in regards to the issue of diet and spirituality. You want to, I, I can't get it. It's already, let me, um, I think it's already, already passed. Hold on. Journeyfilms.com, right? So friends, our job now is to wake up the minds of the people. Wake up your co-workers. First, wake up yourself. Wake up your children. It's time for mothers now and fathers to start putting before their children a diet that will promote life and longevity. Wake up the minds. And there are three books which we encourage uh, that will help to wake us up in regards to health and spirituality. Um, wake up the minds. The Ministry of Healing are powerful. But we're told that this book contains the mind of the great physician. Also, Councils on Health. And also, Councils on Diets and Food, which is a compilation, friends. So again, these three books, along with other books, with our Bible, our manual, will help to wake up the minds in regards to health. Now, we're going to move right into our study. And my clock hasn't even been ticking. Wow. All right. We're going to move right into our study now. On, on, we're going to continue, and we're going to actually bring this, this caption to its end. Now, Question number one. Now, we're filling in the blanks. Let's get our Bibles. Let's get our King James Bibles open. Question number one now says now, what attitude did the Israelites display towards God's ideal diet? Let's go to Numbers. Numbers chapter 6. Numbers chapter 11. What attitude did the Israelites display to God's ideal diet of manna? And we discovered that what, what manna was, what breast milk is to the child, manna was to God's people. Numbers 11, verse number 6. Moses now writes now, the Bible says now, But now our souls are dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. Friends, these words breathe what we call one of contempt. Fill it in. It was one of the, the attitude that they, that, they, that they displayed towards God's ideal diet was one of contempt, one of disdain for the diet that God has given to them. Now, we're told in, in, in Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 280, Ellen White says this now, they became weary of the food prepared for them by angels and sent to them from heaven. They knew, it, they knew it was just the food God wished for them to have. 
and that it was helpful for them and their children. Notwithstanding their hardship in the wilderness, there was not, this, this blew my mind, there was not a feeble one among their tribes, friends. They were healthy and robust, but they showed contempt. They were weary, and the Bible says, let us not be weary in well-doing. Are you weary this morning of the plant based that? Are you yearning for something else? Are you weary in well-doing? Let us not become weary or display contempt for the diet that God has given to his church. Now, question number two now says now, among whom among them instigated the lusting for flesh? There was an issue in the camp. There was a, a murmuring complaint for flesh. Who was the authors? Who were the instigators of this, this movement? This me too quote movement for flesh. Me too flesh. Who was the author? We are told in Numbers chapter 11 verse number 4. The Bible says now. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting and the children of Israel also wept again, said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? So, look what happened now. Verse, num, num, verse 5 says, Now, we remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, and the cucumbers, and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. That's some SKV fish. Verse 6 says, But now our souls are dried away, and there's nothing uh, at all beside this manna before our eyes. Verse 10 says, Then the people, then Moses heard the people wept throughout their family. Friend, they were crying, Oh God, God. Instead of weeping over their sins, they were weeping over flesh. Oh Lord, I want some fish. God, yeah, man, what's wrong with you? I want some fish. Literally, Moses heard it. Every man at the door of his tent and the anger, and it made God angry. They're really, really weeping, friends. Exodus chapter 16, jot this text down, not in your handout. Verse 3, the Bible says now, And the children of Israel said unto Moses, Would to God we had died in the hand of the Lord in Egypt when we sat and eat our flesh pots. So who were the instigators? It was the mixed multitude, oh, those half-breed. And we had a whole lecture on them, half-breed, mixed multitude, right? Friends, right? They were the authors, and then this now spilled over. The, the, the murmur and the complaint became contagious. Look what she says now. She says, this is from um, the Spirit of Prophecy, the same book. She says, God continued to feed the Hebrews' host with the bread rained from heaven, but they were not satisfied. Their depraved appetites craved meat, which God in his wisdom had withheld. In a great measure from them, Satan, the author of disease and misery, will approach God's people when he can, where, 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 where he can have great success. He has controlled the appetite in a great measure from the time of his success, successful experiment with Eve in leading her to eat the forbidden fruit. She says, he came with his temptation first to the mixed multitude the unbelieving Egyptians and stirred them up to sedition and murmuring. They would not be content with the helpful food which God had provided for, for them. Their depraved, underscore, their depraved Egyptian appetites, friends, crave a greater variety, especially flesh meats. She says this murmuring soon infected nearly the whole body of the people. At first, God did not gratify their lustful appetites, but cause his judgment to come upon them and consume most of the guilty by lightning from heaven. Yet this, instead of humbling them, seemed only to increase their murmuring brothers and sisters. So friends, here, here we say the mixed multitude were the authors and the instigators of this movement that clamored, yearned for flesh. Now look how God is good. Now, they really wanted fish. Now, question number three. Now, instead of giving them fish, what did God provide instead? Now, here we see God could have given them fish. I mean, he could have worked a miracle. And when you read the text, Moses said to God, are you going to cause the sea to bring the fish? How are you going to get the fish? So they really wanted the fish. But God did not, in his mercy, give them the fish. 
He gave them something that was a little bit easier to digest, a little bit more healthier. Now, we seem to think that fish is the healthiest of all the meat. Far from it, friends. We're going to talk about it, friends. God decided not to give them the fish, which even in the sea, they didn't have all that pollution. But bear in mind, all the dead bodies were, 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 were in the sea, so they, the, the, the fish had started to eat the Egyptians by, by the time we come to this point. God now gave them something a little bit healthier, easy to digest. Look at verse number 31 now. I think your handout says verse 6. It should say verse 31. So please, that's a typo on, on my part, right? Uh, look what God gave. Instead of giving them fish, what did God provide instead? Verse 31 says, And there went forth a wind from the Lord and brought quails from the sea and let them fall by the camp as it were a day's journey on this side and as it were a day's journey on the other side round about the camp and as it were two cubits high upon the face of the earth. Friends, God gave them quails and that has been my title quails or manna one you can have but not both then now so God gave them the quail so friends here we see they cried for it God as a good parent didn't give them the fish he gave them quails now watch this thing now so why did God destroy them Number four is crucial now. Number four says now, what happened after God now brought quails? Verse 32 says now, now friends, this is where it got sticky. Verse 32 of Numbers 11 says now, And the people stood up all that day, and all that night, and all the next day. Thus they violated the law of health. No rest. And they gathered quails. The Bible says now, he that gathered, least gathered ten omers. So a single individual by himself gathered ten omers. And it, 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 it took you all day and all night, you're going to see, to gather. And they spread them abroad, aboard for themselves, round about the camp. Friends, the people gathered ten omers. Now, what's an omer? How do we calculate what 10 homers now? Let's just look at the bird, the bird called quail. A quail is not a very big bird, a little over seven inches long. On an average, a general only weighing about four ounces, right? And it, it, it is very widespread bird and it's found to even today in Europe, in Asia and in Africa. And it is a clean bird. Now, friends, let's put things into perspective now. Remember I told you, when I preach, I appeal to the intellect. See, I'm not, I'm not here to get you shout and all. No, 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 we're not trying to break no sweat. I want you to think because we are right where they are. Now, four ounces. Now, you know, thanks to 9-11, you cannot transport any liquid on the plane in your carry-on luggage exceeding four ounces. So when you think of a quail, let's measure it now. You're thinking of a four-ounce bottle. That's what it really is, right? Four ounces. Now, watch this now, friends. The Bible says that these people, these gluttons, these craven, gravelicious, greedy people stood up all day and all night and all the next day. That's how many hours that? That's 24, 40, that's 72 hours, Right? And they gathered quails, 10 omers. Now, let's break down what 10 omers is now. Note now. How many birds are in an omer? Are an omer? No. An omer is 22 liters. That's about 58 gallons. So when you think of 10 omers, you're thinking of an omer is a, is a is, this is an omer. This is a 58 gallon garbage can. Let's put it in perspective now, right? So he gathered at least 10 omers. So, so he gathered at least a 580 gallons of little birds, which is 18 garbage can full. One person, a man. That's about three cubits yard of birds 
or enough to fill the bed of a full-size pickup truck overflowing, friends. Now, that, 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 that is cyanosis, sickness. You're talking about 10 omers, friends, that's the amount of birds. And by the way, those stones is about four ounces, a little bit less. You're thinking um, people gathering 10 omers. That is gluttony. That is gravelicious. That is intemperance. Abusing which God gave them. And look what happened in verse 33 now. The Bible says now, and while the flesh was between their teeth. As a matter of fact, they, they, it came out of their ears, some version says, out of their nostrils. Moses, David says, they ate so much. It came out of their, just, just came out. And, and yet while the flesh was between their teeth, ere it was chewed, the wrath of God was kindled against the people and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. We are told, Ellen White now magnifies this now. Send out, please read now. A strong wind blowing from the sea brought. A strong wind blowing from the sea now brought flocks of quails. Mm -hmm. God gave the people that which was not for their highest good uh -huh. because they persisted in desiring it. All right. They would not be satisfied with those things that would prove a benefit to them. All right. Their rebellious desires were gratified, but they were left to suffer the results. There it is, friends. Look what happened now. She said they what? They feasted without restraint uh -huh. and their excesses were speedily punished. The Lord smote the people with a very great plague. Large numbers were cut down by burning fevers, while the most guilty among them were smitten as soon as they tasted the food for which they had lusted. Wow, friends. And so you must understand, God did not destroy them for eating the plague, for eating the quail. No, he gave it to them. They were destroyed because, friends, they took that which God gave them to excess. And it wasn't God's idea. Now, after God gave them their requests, what did it bring to their souls? We're we talk about Psalms 106, that we should read it once per week. Even years later, David, under the inspiration of God, was told to pen this situation as you wrote the book of Psalms, right? The Bible says now in Psalms 106, verse 14, David says, they soon forgot his works and waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. He gave them their requests, but sent leanness to their soul. Go back, I, I, I encourage you, Look up what leanness means. Go on YouTube and type in leanness in the Hebrew of this text, and you're going to see what it brought. Leanness to their souls, brothers and sisters. Psalm 78, verse 26, David says, He caused an east wind to blow in the heaven, and by the power he brought the south wind. He rained flesh also upon them as a dust, and feathered fowls like the sands of the sea. He let it fall in the midst of the camp, round about their habitation. Verse 29 says, They did eat and were filled, for he gave them their desires. They were not estranged from their lust, but while the meat was yet within their mouth, the wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote them, smote down the chosen men of Israel. Friend, this diet brought leanness. And friends, I'm telling you, if we persist in a flesh diet, it will still bring leanness to your soul, leanness upon your children, leanness in your life, friends. You cannot live a exuberant life, a life filled with that which God desires for you while we are still feasting on the flesh parts of Israel. It will bring leanness. And for some of us, it has brought leanness already. Leanness. We are told, please read now the adrenaline desire. Mm -hmm. 
Their depraved appetites control them, mm -hmm. and God gave them flesh meats as they desired, mm -hmm. and let them suffer the results of their grati of gratifying their lustful appetites. Uh -huh. Burning fevers cut down very large numbers of the people. Those who had been the most guilty in their murmurings were slain as soon as they tasted the meat for which they had lusted. She says, if they had submitted to have the Lord select their food uh -huh. for them and had been thankful and satisfied with food of which they could eat freely without injury. Freely. That's the man of freely. That's fruits, nuts, grains, and veggies. Freely. Keep on reading. They would not have lost the favor of God and then been punished for their rebellious murmurings by great numbers of them being slain. All right, friends. So here we have now. Now, friends, that's the type. Now, friends, we're going to transition now on the signal. Friends, I believe that we have now come to a point in the history of the world where every Seventh-day Adventist need to stop eating <coughs> meat ASAP. Amen. Friends, I'm talking to you as your friend. You need to stop cooking flesh for your husband. If he wants to cook it, let him cook it himself. Stop serving meat to your children. If your children go to public schools, you need to get up in the morning, pack them a plant-based diet lunch and teach them the dangers of meat eating and that they are not their own. They are bought with a price. Friends, the time has now come. I appeal to you where we as a people must now take a firm stand against eating meat. We are told, let the diet reform be progressive. Let the people be taught how to prepare food, food without the use of milk or butter. Tell them, watch it now, tell them that the time will soon come, written over 100 years ago, when there will be no safety in using eggs, milk, cream, or butter. Why? Here it is now. Because disease, because disease in animals is increasing in proportion to the increase of wickedness among men. The, uh, the, 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 the time is near when, because of iniquity of the fallen race, the whole animal creation will groan under diseases that curse our earth, friends. Now, she, she, now I'm going to come back and qualify the statement. I'm going to read one more. This now is taken from Council of Dance and Food, page 386. She says this now. Some animals that are brought to slaughter seem to realize by instinct what is to take place. And they become furious and literally mad. Mad cow disease. You're right. They are killed while in that mad state. And their flesh is prepared for market. market. Their meat is poison and has produced in those who have eaten it cramps, convulsion, epilepsy, and even sudden death. Yet the cause of this suffering has not been attributed to the meat because the FDA didn't attribute it. And I'd rather believe a true prophet than some than an institution that is more concerned about profit, P R O F I T, yeah. than your health. If a prophet, I believe it. Full stop. I don't need no doctor to violate anything. She says some animals are inhumanely treated while being brought to slaughter. They are literally tortured. And, and after they have endured many hours of extreme suffering, they are butchered. And the Bible says the righteous man considers the life of his beast. You go and you, and you type in a random search, animal slaughter. There are so many from farm to fridge. These people have documented, I have the clips, how the animals are, are, are killed. Animals are even crying. You see tears coming out of their eyes. They are literally mad. And then this, this meat is being it's been, it's been produced and factory and sent to Publix and, and Coke or wherever you want to shop. And then God's people, we buy these things knowing better. And we eat and we become sick and we say, Lord, heal us. And we want God to heal us while we're still eating that which causes diseases. That's an insult. I told you before, friends, the cure is always in the cause. Now, 
she made a very profound statement. I want to I want to back up. She says now, she says the reason why we should stop eating meat, she says now, because disease in animals is increasing in proportion to the increase of wickedness. So, friends, she says that there is a direct link to wickedness increases in these animals. So once we see wickedness increase, we know that disease has increased. Therefore, we have to stop. Now, I'm going to give you a, 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 a stats that shows you that wickedness has increased in proportion. Therefore, friends, it is time for us to stop eating meat. I don't care if it's even kosher. I don't care if it's organic or homegrown. Stop eating it. Now, here's the stats. America, now, again, crime rate is indicative to, to man's morality. And morality is indicative of one's diet. Now, she says the disease in animals is increasing in proportion to the increase of wickedness among men. Now, friends, Ella Moses Mason taught me this. Got to give credit where credit is due. Not going, you know, see, I got to give him credit. Powerful man of God, still miss today, right? Now, America got, got independence in the year 1776. Now, from 76 to 1984 is approximately 280. Eight years. If you check the stats, America had over 500,000 inmates incarcerated, right, for crimes, right? One or two were, you know, put there wrongly. We know that, especially African-American people. You know what I'm saying? Some Jamaicans too, you know what I'm saying, right? So here we see it took 208 years for America to have 500,000 inmates in prison. Remember, as crime increased, so does disease increase. Now, 1984 to 1994 is approximately 10 years, right? 10 years. America had, at that time, within four years now, had over 1 million inmates. So, so what has increased? Crime has increased. Remember, it took 204 years to get 500,000 in, 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 in prison. Within four years, brothers and sisters, America had over 100, a one, a 1 million inmates incarcerated for violent crimes. It tells us that one, disease has increased, and no, wickedness has increased, and therefore, disease has increased. Now, from 1994 to 1998 is four years. Now, look what happened now, how many inmates America had in prison. At that time, they had 1.8 million people incarcerated. Friends, look, it took them four years to get 1.8 million. It took them 208 years to get 500,000. So, friends, you're seeing the maths? It's telling me that, one, wickedness has increased. Therefore, the disease in animals has increased. And that's the signal for us to stop using egg, milk, cheese, and butter. Now, friends, we are in 2020. From 1998 to 2020, how much years is that? How much years, Nathan? I said, I can't, I'm, I'm still, I'm in what, fifth grade, fourth grade, fourth grade. 22 years, as I said, right? You're right, 22 years. And if you check the stats, you can just go on Google. Today, there's approximately 2.3 million inmates in prison today. So, friends, it tells me that wickedness has increased exponentially. And if wickedness has increased, go back to the statement she said now, if wickedness has increased, it tells me, therefore, that the disease in animals has increased and, therefore, it is no longer safe for us to use egg, milk, cheese, and butter. We can use substitutes. Now, watch this now, friends, right? Is that clear? Now, last week in the chat group, somebody asked a question, and I'm, and I'm assuming it's a very sincere question, or they put a comment in it, and, you know, they said that Jesus ate fish. It is true he ate fish. He also walked everywhere he went. You drive. So how do we harmonize Christ eating fish? And Ellen White says that we should come off the fish. How do we harmonize? Do they contradict? Do they complement each other? How do we reconcile Luke, right? Luke chapter where am I? Luke chapter, I thought I had my thing clicked. How do we reconcile Luke 24? Write it down. Bible says they gave him, Jesus, a portion of boiled fish and of honeycomb and he took it and he ate it before their eyes. So you say, Pastor, not Christ ate fish. 
So why can I eat fish? Isn't Christ our example in all things? Yes. Now let's qualify. Friends, first and foremost, we must understand that when Christ ate fish, there were no oil vessels digging for oil out in the Mediterranean. There was no oil spill. Friends, the pollutions, the pollutions that we have, we didn't have it today. Right? So we must understand that the, that, 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 that the fish that, 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 that Christ ate was a lot, in my opinion and estimation, a lot more less polluted. Now look at this thing now, friends, right? We learned in, 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 in a previous lessons back about the 144,000 that one of their main characteristics is that they follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. Wherever Christ goes, they're going to follow him. And where they can't follow him, where they can follow him physically, they will follow him by faith. Now, we know that Jesus, that there were three apartments in the sanctuary. He had an outer court, a holy, and a most holy. Now, when Jesus ate fish, he was in the outer court as earth. Now, when Christ went to heaven, we know he went to the holy place and to perform the, the daily. Right, And he spent approximately 1,810 years in the holy place doing the daily. Now, he must move now to perform the yearly. And the yearly took place now on October 22nd, 1844. Now, so where, is, where, where, where has Christ been now for the last 176 years? Christ has been in the most holy place. So friends, that's where we should be by faith. Because remember, we learned that these are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. Wherever Jesus goes by faith, they follow him. Therefore now, if we must follow, how do we harmonize Christ eating fish? And I can't eat fish. The answer lies in the sanctuary. Now, we learn in the outer court, you had five food groups, right? You had, of course, you had flesh. You had nuts. You had grains, you had vegetables, and you also had fruits. Because, again, when Christ ate flesh, he was in the outer court. Now, you have the holy and the most holy. Where is Christ today? Now, when you go in the holy place now, two, you only find two food groups. You had the nuts, and that was from Aaron's rod that budded almond. Right? You had the grain, which was the manna. And the manna was placed within the ark. And you had the fruits. What fruit was in the most holy place? Pomegranates. We call it pangranot in Jamaica. Pomegranates. And the pomegranates were, on the, were, were actually on the borders of the high priest's garment. So here we see, friends, a fruit diet. Now, really and truly, this was a diet that God gave man before sin. Now, am I saying, no, I'm not saying, no, we need our vegetables. So even though you, you don't see vegetables there, God's ideal is fruits, nuts, grains. So therefore now, as Seventh-day Adventists, when Christ moved into the most holy place, we came into existence in the most holy place. So therefore, the diet that we should be on, again, fruits, nuts, grains, and vegetables is the ideal. So that's how we justify not eating fish, even though Christ ate fish. When Christ ate fish, he was in, you could eat fish in the outer court. But not in the most holy place, as a matter of fact, on the day of atonement. They couldn't eat no meat. They couldn't eat, period, right? Let, jot this text down. Leviticus 23, we're told now, also on the 10th day of the 7th month, which corresponds with our October 22nd, 1844, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you. Ye shall afflict your what? Afflict your souls. That word souls in the Hebrew means nephesh. So on the 10th day of the Seventh month, which corresponds with 1844, the people had to, had, had to afflict their souls and their appetites. That word, that word nephesh in the Hebrew means desire and appetite. So for one day, for one day, friends, they had to fast. So God is not asking us to fast from 1844. The fast that we should be on is one, to loose the bands of wickedness. Yes, help the oppressed. Yes, but the fast that we should be on also is a fast of consuming that in our body that promotes good blood. Good blood give us good thoughts. Good thoughts give us part of character and character rightly formed by the grace of God will take us to eternity, friends. That's how we harmonize not eating fish even though Christ ate fish. The answer lies 
in the sanctuary. And so, friends, I am appealing to you for us now to take a firm stand, a very firm stand against meat eaten in all its form. Look what she says now. Please read it now. Every day. Every day, men in positions of trust have decided to make upon which depends results of great importance. Uh -huh. Often they have to think rapidly, and this can be done successfully by those only who practice strict temperance. The mind strengthens under the correct treatment of the physical and mental powers. If the strain is not too great, new vigor comes with every taxation. All right. What she says now, but often. But often the work of those who have important plans to consider and important decisions to make is affected for evil by the results of improper diet. Did you get that, friends? Friends, your diet does dictate the choices you make. She says, please read. A disordered stomach produces a disordered, uncertain state of mind. People are, are tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Go off now, often. Often it causes irritability, harshness, or injustice. Do you get it, friends? We are in the season of injustice. Do you know, friends, that most of the injustices that have been perpetrated amongst people of whatever class, orientation, Friends, a part of that lies at an improper diet. You'll never hear a CNN say the reason why. Let's check the diet of that police officer that had his foot at Mr. Floyd's neck. Or these other officers. You check. These men are eating rear steak. Bloody meat. And so you become animalistic. When I was in Jamaica, we would, you know, we would have a cliche. When a guy was acting wild, we'll say, well, y'all eat meat? Raw meat? We, we were just boys. We had no science. We were, you know, we were not even that educated. But we attributed people acting wild and erratic to what you're eating. Raw meat. And so it is. You are what you eat, friends. And so here we see injustice, friends. And I guarantee you, brothers and sisters, if you run the, a scientific check, most of the people who perpetrate injustice against any class, you check their diet. You check the people's diet who suppress present truth in the church. You check these conference presidents' diet. Since I'm not lying to you. I kid you. I'm not here airing dirty laundry. And I'm going to try to put this where you don't know. But I, I was, you know, on a blacklist. And for being Adventist. And the man that put me on the blacklist. God worked it out where, you know, we, were, we end up going to lunch together. It was a nice spread, and the people who made the spread, they, they were very conscious that vegetarians are coming. And so they had a big spread, and I just picked what I could eat. And I saw, and I wasn't judging the man, I was just observing. The very man who banned me from proclaiming these truths that has won so many to the Adventist faith. What that man put in his body. And I sat him, eat, I saw him eating. Now, you, you, you want to eat that, that's, that's your prerogative. Really affected the man's mind, whereby he was calling good evil and evil. That man was not on a plant based diet. And friends, I'm telling you, friends, people who commit these horrible atrocities to, in society, these police officers or even criminals, look what they're putting in their body. They're eating all kind of bloody meat, all kind of half cooked meat all kind of crazy stuff in their diet and it forms a rebellious and a wicked state. That's what she's saying, friends. Injustice. We need to go out there and march. <laughs> Put a sign that says, get off the meat if you act along with everything else. But we're not, we see, we're not doing that. We don't want to do that. It's easier to just go out there with a sign saying whatever. Remember, the cause lies within the cure, friends. Please read on, she says. Many a plan that would have been a blessing to the world has been set aside. Wow. Many unjust, oppressive, even cruel measures have been carried as the result of diseased conditions due to wrong habits of eating. Friends, that is the foundation for injustice. Take a picture. It's not the politician. It's their diet. Because really and truly, friends, if we're eating right, now, I'm not saying if, you know, you become a vegetarian, you're going to be holy because Hitler was one and he killed six million Jews. All these things must be linked with Christ, friends. It makes a big difference. You are what you eat. Now, 
So here we see, friends, it's time for us to take a firm stand against meat eating, friends. Very firm stand. Very firm stand. Again, and I'm emphasizing it, friends. By the grace of God, you must get off that meat. You have to get off that meat. Stop eating that chicken, that beef, that turkey. You need to get off it and beg God. And he can. If, listen, if the Rasta man can do it. As a matter of fact, there was a guy down there in Miami. His name was Kanatas. Kanatas. Rasta man. He had a, a, a vegetarian shop. And, when you, and there's a big sign on that. The sign says, no meat sold here. If the Rasta man can do it. And friends, why can't God's people do it? If new ages can do it. If movie stars can do it to tone their body and them going to bust hellfire wide open with their Oscars, they don't repent. And it's just pure willpower. There ain't no God mobilizing, motivating them. They want to look good. They want to play the part. If they can do it, why can't God's people with the, with, with, with the help and the assistance of the Holy Spirit, friends? I, because I believe we don't want to do it. That's why we're still on it, friends. By the grace of God, you must get off. And you must get off very soon. Now, should vegetarianism be a test of fellowship? What are we saying? A test of fellowship. Should, should not being a vegetarian exclude me from church office or to join a church? No, it should not, friends. We are told, friends, while we do not make the flesh, pardon me, while we do not make the use of flesh meat a test, while we do not want to force any to give up its use, yet it is our duty to, re to, to, requ uh, to request that, that no minister of the conference shall make light of or oppose the message of reform on this point. Friends, I'm going to say this, friends. Too often, many pastors, they take the pulpit on Sabbath and they make these cynical comments. You veggie, it's out there and, 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 and yeah, that man and that man who committed that, that that adultery and he was a vegetarian. So what? That doesn't take away the from the path that, that is a right diet. So friends, even if we're struggling, we should not use our influence to slight health reform. Even if you are struggling, don't use your struggle as license for somebody else. She goes on to say. If in the race of the light, sorry, sorry, pardon me. If in the face of the light God has given concerning the effect of meat eating on our system, you will still continue to eat meat. You must bear the consequence. And too many of our ministers, I know one personally, I know a couple who died of heart attack, mm -hmm. left their wife, their children, fatherless, because they refuse to embrace manna. She says, but do not make a position, but don't take a position before the people that will permit them to think that it's not necessary to, necessary to call for reform in regards to, to meat eating because the Lord is calling for reform in counterworking the efforts of your fellow laborers who are teaching health reform. You are to act, or you, you act out of order working in a wrong side. So friends, we are not, we should not, make vegetarianism or veganism a test of fellowship. I could not say that because a man is, doesn't eat, not a vegetarian, he's not a Christian. That, 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 is, that is demonic. That is satanic. No, it's not a test of fellowship. I don't believe a man should be excluded from office in the church if that man is not a vegetarian. Now again, friends, there are other rules that may exclude him. But if the man is still eating meat, it should not be a test of fellowship. Whereby he can't hold this office. Or I can't hang around him because he eat meat. Stay away. Thou eatest meat, thou meat eater. You stay on that side. No, we shouldn't do that, friends. It is not a test of fellowship. Now, number seven now. What about pastor, pastors, evangelists, and teachers? These are not the average norm now. In Ephesians 4.11... God gave gifts when he went to heaven. We know. And he gave, now friends, how many gifts God gave? How many gifts? He gave five, right? He gave apostles. He gave prophets. He gave evangelists. He gave 
pastors and he gave teachers fivefold gifts. The apostles would be our administrators. The prophets, well, we know we only, we only had two. Hazen Foss, well, William, William Foy. Foy had a gift and Ellen White, Foss didn't want it. So we only had two in our denominational history, right? The evangelists, which I consider myself an evangelist. We go from place to place, right? Pastors and teachers, people who work within, who stand before our students. Now, these gifts were given now for the perfecting of the saints. For, so you cannot be perfected while we're neglecting any one of these gifts. We, we need all the gifts, friends. You can't say, well, you know what? I'm in a, in a prophet thing. I only want the pastor. And you can't say, bond the conference and bond the presidents. And f I don't want no conference president. I only want my evangelist. No! All gifts are needed. And it will be very much active until probation closes. Now, she says they edify. Now, so here we have five gifts. Now, isn't it amazing, friends? How many senses do we have? Nathan, how many senses do we have, Nathan? Can you name them? You mean you can't name it five senses? Well, you're going to good school and you talk to your teacher. Who's your teacher, right? Five senses, right? Here they are. Smell, sight, hearing, touch, taste. Now, these five senses are the gatekeeper to the brain. Now, friends, watch this now. So when we think of these five senses, we must think of them as the gatekeeper. Now, these fivefold gifts, watch it now. <laughs> these are the gatekeeper to salvation, to heaven, friends. Now, so if the gatekeeper is off, then there's a problem. So now God expects the gatekeeper to keep his sensibilities sharp. So friends, while the congregation may eat the meat and get away with it now, God expects the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the teachers and the pastors not because they are the guide. And if they are guiding souls, if, they are, if their minds are not clear, then God help the people who rely upon them for guidance. Just as how these five, we're told we should guard well Avenues of the soul. If these five senses become blunted, our spirituality is therefore now, if these five gifts become distorted through wrong eating habits, then they will lead souls to perdition. Now look what she says now about meat, eating meat and pastors and teachers and administrators and so forth. Now look what she said now. Please read now. Let, let not any... Mm -hmm. Let not any of our ministers set an evil example in the eating of flesh meat. Wow. Let them and their families live up to the light of health reform. Let not our ministers animalize their own nature and the nature of their children. So, friends, if there's anybody in the church who should be, who should be leading now in health reform and not eating meat, it should be the pastor, his wife, and him, pitting them, him children. But too often, they're the ones that are fighting against it fighting against it now i tell you listen you know my kids you know it's called free will but not in this house now we're not gonna cook no none of that stuff once you become 18 you can leave when you leave you're on your own but while you're while you're while you're in our care we're gonna feed you manna 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 and some more manna look what she says again this is from volume four many of our ministers are digging their graves with their teeth mm -hmm. The system, in taking care of the burden placed upon the digestive organs, suffers, and a severe draft is made upon the brain. For every offense committed against the laws of health, the transgressor must pay the penalty in his own body. Wow, friends. And I'm, friends, I've known, I've known a couple who have died because of heart problem. And, 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 I, and, I, and, I, and I know for a fact, and I'm not judging, these people were not on a plant-based diet. One more reference. This is from Council on Health, page 449. Our ministers should become intelligent upon this question. Uh -huh. They should not ignore it, nor be turned aside by those who call them extremists. Uh -huh. Let them find out what constitutes true health reform and teach its principles, both by precept and by a quiet, consistent example. So every minister 
should take the should teach the people. And if you can't teach it, bring somebody in to teach it. Teach their congregation. As a matter of fact, we are told one of the very first thing a pastor should do as he goes to a new district is one, educate the people in how to keep the Sabbath and how to eat properly. Because if we get these two things down, friends, then I believe by the grace of God, we can move the mountain, right? So someone's asking, are you saying vegetarians can't have a heart attack? No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying vegetarian can't have a heart attack, friends. But what causes a heart attack? Heart attack is a lifestyle issue. So if now, listen, because of sin, we will suffer, we will die. We will die, right? But I'm simply saying, friends, scientifically, heart attack can be traced back to an animal, animal-based diet, lack of exercise. So I'm saying now that we must take all these health into consideration because, yeah, you can be eating vegetables and not exercising. The heart will not be able to work properly. So in context now, friends, that's why we, t we started off with all the eight laws of health are important, friends. All. Yes, you can have a heart attack and, and, and Brussels sprout, but it's rare unless it's something genetic or if you are negligent of one of the eight laws of health. But by the grace of God, if we are abiding by the eight laws of health, love Jesus, apart from something being hereditary, I don't think so. Now, I'm no medical doctor. I'm a country boy, so take that with a grain of salt, right? Now, what about the issue now of ministers getting paid with tithe and still eating meat? Now, this is a very serious, friends. Look what look the counsel she, she gives us now in regards to tithe, those who su supported by the tithe and, and meat eaten, right? She says, please read now. Will any who are ministers of the gospel proclaiming the most solemn truth ever given to mortals set an example in returning to the flesh pots of Egypt? There's a question. Will any? Keep on reading now. Will those who are supported by the tithe from God's storehouse Permit themselves by self-indulgence to poison the life-given current flowing through their veins. Will they disregard the light and warnings that God has given them? If the stomach is not properly cared for, the formation of an upright moral character will be hindered. Friend, did you get that, friends? And some of us are waiting for CNN to say that. They're not going to say that. Because if they do that, then uh-oh the meat industry to take a plummet. Friends, the prophet says we must believe it. And if we believe a prophet, we'll get a prophet's reward. Please read. The brain and nerves are in sympathy with the stomach. Mm. Erroneous eating and drinking results in erroneous thinking and acting. Friends, again, I remember we learned that this, this diet would produce insubordination, friends. And the reason why you right now are bucking this, this teaching right now is because you're on it. Humble yourself. Let's humble ourselves and say, Lord, I know that my eating habits is not right. Light has come by your grace. I'm going to submit myself. I'm going to learn how to cook a helpful. And I'm not talking about buying these stuff from Walmart where it's just pure oil. Learn to make stuff from scratch. Now, these things have their place. Don't get me wrong. But it should not be the end, friends. I'm talking to myself too. We should learn to eat more greens. If you can't eat it, drink it. <laughs> but get it in your system along with other helpful things, right? So, friends, here we see that, that, the, that, that and there are other statements she did, cotton statements she reads. But shall those who are people from the tithe sit before the people and example eat me? No, friends, no, no. Now, I'm not saying for you to go to your pastor and say, Pastor, see there? Pastor not say, don't lie on me. I'll deny it in a court of law. I didn't say to go to your pastor and chastise your pastor. You can, you can, you can, um, you can uh, talk to your pastor in love, write him a letter, encourage him to get off to me. But don't go there and start beating the man over the head. Pastor not said, Pastor not didn't say anything and get me in trouble. I'm already hated already. I can't take no more. Okay, please. Right? Right? Look what she says now. Another, another quotation about ministers. Those who use flesh meat disregard all the warnings God has given concerning this question. They have no evidence that they are walking in safe paths. Can we possibly have confidence in ministers who at tables where flesh is served join with others in eating it? Friends, this is serious, friends. Now, friend, listen, again, I am not saying to you to go out there and blast your pastor. 
I'm saying you follow that man as far as he follows Christ. And if your pastor is advocating eating meat, you shouldn't follow him on that point. And again, friends, can we have confidence in people, ministers, teachers, professors who are willfully? Now, there's a thing when a man is struggling. A man is struggling, God, you know my desire. I really want to get the victory. That's one case. But you have those who are not, they don't even care. And they're using their influence to mock, harass those who are teaching the true principles of health. Can we have confidence in a man who sits down in his theology? And friends, I'm telling you, friends, again, if you, if you go back and check the loose liberalism that is in our churches, check the table, check the plates in some cases. Not all, in some cases. I don't want to paint with a broad brush now. In some cases, they are eating meat, full stop, and not eating in the right way. I know this is a hard, this is a hard teaching, friends. I know so you may log, want to log off, one may want to log off. It's okay. Friends, we are nearing the end, and they ate manna until they came to the borders of Canaan, and all those who wanted flesh, them were shaken out. Check the history. Check the black book. It's right here in Exodus. All right. One more now, ties and offering statement, right? Please read, she says, those who... Those who search this word should keep the mind clear. Never should they indulge perverted appetites in eating or drinking. Why? Why shouldn't they now? Here it is now. If they do this, the brain will be confused. Uh -huh. They will not. They will be unable to bear the strain of digging deep to find out the meaning of those things which relate to the closing scenes of this earth's history. Friends, they are unable to speak to the times because their appetites are perverted. They cannot see COVID, see in COVID-19 and these revolutions, omens of Christ coming. They will see, oh, some utopia on earth, friends. They can't handle Daniel chapter 11. They can't handle these deep truths in the Bible. And that's why on Sabbath, them sermons are so fluffy. They're not saying nothing. I'd rather go watch. Listen, if it wasn't for the council, not forsaken the assembly, and I'm, thank God I'm preaching every Sabbath. So I have to, I have to subject myself to some, some, some carnivore. But friends, I'm telling you, friends, the sermons we hear on Sabbath, boy, them sermons need to come again. They are not properly constructed. They have no Christocentric in them, no doctrine, no eschatology. It's just a social talk. I, I'd rather go watch the ants scrawl or the ants work. You learn more from the ants than some of these sermons on Sabbath. And again, because the diet they eat during the week, they come on Sabbath, Friday night, they put something together, one, two texts, and there's a heavy emphasis on music. The praise team sing for 45 minutes and they come up with a little talk and that's it. And that's it. The diet, friends, the brain can't handle the strain. I remember I was tiling, tiling my house. And so I realized we didn't have any, um, any hanger racks to put up to hang your towel. So that's a problem, boy, you know what I'm saying? So I bought some of them and took them down. And when your towel was concrete in Jamaica, we ain't got no drywall. This is hard concrete of cement and steel. So friends, I'm drilling. I had to drill the tile now to get to the concrete. And brothers and sisters, I'm drilling. And, and, and Bolo say, the bit, the, bit, the bit of smoke. I said, what's wrong with this bit? I'm, I'm, hitting, I'm hitting the thing. And it, Finally, I had to go call my buddy. He said, you're using the wrong bit. I said, but it's an iron bit. He says, no, you have to, you have to use that's a wood bit I was using. I didn't know. I was, I'm, 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 no, I'm, a, I'm a preacher. I don't know these things, right? I was using a wood bit to drill concrete. He said you have to get a concrete bit. So, and they, they look the same, but they're different. The tip is different. The tip has like a shark head. When that man brought that concrete bit and went boom, brrr, friends, you see what happens if we're, if we're eating this crazy diet, we cannot penetrate the word of God we can't dig deep in our devotion we can't go deep and we're told surface readers are going to be lost because we are shifting sand we got to dig deep and a part of us digging deep 
is to make sure our minds, we are feeding the brain the right thing because it takes a lot. She says, the strain, she says, the strain of digging deep, friends. Let's get on that diet, right? So what? And friends, you know, as we talk about this thing, we, we want to be balanced because, you know, people will, you know, run off and, and become Pharisee on one hand. No, we want to be balanced. Note now, when it comes to the issue of a plant-based diet, what approach should we take? Friends, we want to avoid all extremes. That's why I did three parts. Avoid extremes. Proverbs 4.27 says now, let thine eye look straight on. Let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of your feet and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right or to the left. Now, if you can't go to the right or to the left, the only option is you have to go take a center approach. We must take a center approach when it comes on to a plant-based diet, friends. Friends, out of, I tell people all the time, if I had to run and I could only take a few books, this is what I would take. You hear me? If I could only take about 10 books, 10 books I could take, uh, more than 10. Let's say, let's, let's say 11 books. Let's say 12 books. Uh, let's say 13 books. 13 books I could take. I'll take my King James Version Bible. Hear me now, friends. I would take my Desire of Ages, Great Controversy, Acts of the Apostles, Pictures and Prophet, Prophets and King. That's six. I would take my Ministry of Healing. Hear me now, friends. I'm not leaving my Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. Friends, and then I would take the nine volumes of the church. Friends, I hope you have these books. And are actually reading them. Don't say, well, I got them. What's in it? I don't know. Friends, I don't know how we find time for everything else. If we add up the amount of time we spend on social media, surfing, just surfing, just surfing, as opposed to reading these books, friends. In volume nine of the testimony, Ellen White appeals to us, to the church, to take a firm stand against meat eating. Look what she says now. Please read now. We do not mark... Go ahead. We do not mark out any precise line to be followed in diet. Hear that, friends? So I'm not here trying to give you a list. I say let's eat healthy. Look what she says now. But we do say that in countries where there are fruits, grains, and nuts in abundance... Flesh food is not the right food for God's so people. So, friends, we're talking about countries where... Let's leave North America. Let's go to the islands. Let's look at Jamaica. Friends, there is an, ab there is an overabundance. As a matter of fact, I believe with all my heart, friends, hear me now. It is easier to be a vegetarian in Jamaica than in America. Let me, let me say it again. It is easier to be a vegetarian in Jamaica or I should say the Caribbean than North America. As a matter of fact, we should have more vegetarians in Adventism in the Caribbean than in North America. Because friends, I'm, you know I'm talking the truth, friends. It's just pure green down there. These things, you have no winter to deal with. Like, oh, forget, forget Europe. It's the blizzard over there, right? It is easier, but yet if you check the amount of vegetarians in Adventism, in the, especially Jamaica, Lord, says minuscule. It should not be. So where there is abundance of fruits, nuts, grains, God expects us to gravitate more towards that than to a flesh diet. Right? Please read now. I have. I have been instructed that flesh food has a tendency to animalize the nature. And that's why she says the more largely flesh is consumed, she says the more largely the animal propensities are strengthened. Animal passion. That dog don't care. Anytime, anywhere, any place. The lower passions are now strengthened. Right? To rob men and women of that love and sympathy which they should feel for everyone. There it is, friends. Again, it goes back to injustice. 
love. How in the world can you see? And, and just people were crying, officer, the man can't breathe. And that guy, a Korean guy, wherever he's from, he's telling them, no, no, no. That man is devoid of sympathy. And again, it comes back to the diet, brothers and sisters. If you check those men diet, all of them were car car carnivorous. I'm not saying that if I just eat fruits and grains, because you got some wicked vegetarian, Lord have mercy, Jesus. But I'm simply saying for it does play a part. Please read now. And to give the lower passions control over the higher powers of the being. All right now. If meat eaten was ever helpful, it is not safe now. That was written in the 1900s, friends. We are in 2020, friends, where there's oil spill, cancer. You, you are running a risk, let alone buy meat in Walmart. At least, man, you know, feed your, go to Kroger's or some, uh, Whole Foods or some of these health places. Are you crazy? Are you mad? You don't know what, what disease animals, right? Cancers, tumors, and pulmonary diseases, COVID, are largely caused by meat eating. There it is, friends. I'd rather believe Ellen White any day than Dr. So-and-so and Dr. So-and-so and Dr. I don't care where he went to school. Because if this is not a foundation, he is as ignorant as anything as friends. She says, please read now, we are not to make, uh-huh. We are not to make the use of flesh eating a test of fellowship, uh -huh. but we should consider the influence that professed believers who use flesh foods have over others. Uh -huh. As God messengers, shall we not say to the people, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God? Uh -huh. Shall we not bear a decided testimony against the indulgence of perverted appetite? Will any who are ministers of the gospel proclaiming the most solemn truth ever given to mortals set an example in returning to the flesh pots of Egypt? Shall the minister bring their church into flesh pots of Egypt? Shall? Will those? Will those who are supported by the tithe from God's storehouse permit themselves by self-indulgence to poison the life-given current flowing through their veins? Mm -hmm. Will they disregard the light and warnings that God has given them? The health of the body is to be regarded as essential for growth in grace and acquirement of an even temper. If the stomach is not properly cared for, the formation of an upright moral character will be hindered. Will be hindered. She says the brain. The brain and nerves are in sympathy with the stomach. Erroneous eating and drinking result in erroneous thinking and acting. Uh -huh. All are now being tested and proved. Mm -hmm. We have been baptized into Christ. And if, our, and if we will act our part by separating from everything that would drag us down and make us what we ought not to be, there will be given us strength to grow up into Christ who is our living head, and we shall see the salvation of God. Friends, I appeal to you. We have done three lectures on this topic. God wants us to get off that flesh pot and to feast on manna, which is anti-type fruits, nuts, grains, and veggies. In conclusion, numerous scientific studies have shown that, that a vegetarian diet, particularly one emphasizing the whole food, such as fruits, grains, nuts, and vegetables is the best for the human body. Vegetarianism is on the rise around the world for a variety of reasons, ethical, ecological, religious, and even narcissistic, friends. Friends, everybody's getting on board but the people of God. As Seventh-day Adventists, we believe that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. See 1 Corinthians six nineteen, And that we are to take care of it in the best way possible by living healthy lifestyle, including getting proper exercise, enough rest, drinking plenty of water, enjoying fresh air, sunshine, staying away from harmful substance as alcohol, tobacco, and caffeine. Getting proper nutrition, trusting in God for divine power. God's preferred diet for us is a plant-based diet as expressed in the Bible as our original diet, Genesis 1, 29, 3, 18. Now let me be clear. Very clear. 
we are saved by grace. We are saved by Christ's grace and his righteousness. Not our own works. We do not earn our way to heaven by being vegetarianism or eating a proper diet. Friends, let me say, you can't eat, drink, juice your way to heaven. Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercies, he saved us. And again, friends, we can't eat our weight. We are saved by grace through faith. But then again, what we eat and how we live is very much tied to our spiritual lives and is the product of our con connection with Jesus. There is an er erroneous, enormous connection with what we eat and your physical and spiritual health, friends. We cannot eat our way to heaven, for that would be salvation by works. Now, do we negate works? Do we then disdain works? No, the Christian has works. Let your, the Bible says, let your good works be known towards man. Revelation 14, 13 says, I heard a voice from heaven saying, right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, say the spirit that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. So the Christian has works, but where is his works? Note, it's like this. The works don't go before, the, is that the carriage? No, that, 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 that's, that's a wrong picture. The carriage goes before, not before, after the horse. So we don't put the works. No, who goes first? Christ goes first. And then good works, vegetarianism, healthy lifestyle, doing good, all these things follow the Christian. These things are an outgrowth of what Christ has done. Therefore, law without love produces legalism. That's a Phariseeism. Love without law produces liberalism. Both extremes, the right and left. One say you can eat your way to heaven. One say, well... You know, God ain't going to judge me. God is love. Let's praise him. Avoid both camps, friends. Bo and the devil doesn't care how he gets you to hell. You can go there in your conservatism, hum, humming your hymns, or go in there in your loose neo-Pentecostalism, crazy worship. He doesn't care. Let's avoid all extremes. Extremes in everything, also extremes in diet, right? We cannot eat our way to heaven, for that would be salvation by works. However, friends, the way we eat may keep us out of the kingdom of God. Those who enter the 1844 family of God will eat, drink, and dress, and act as do other members of his family. Here's the punchline now. These things do not make them citizens of the heavenly kingdom, but they are evidence that they are citizens. Citizenship is a gift from God while conduct is an evidence of that relationship, friends. So vegetarian is just a conduct. That's what it is, friends. Therefore, I urge you to read the book, Councils on Diets and Food, from page 373 all the way to page 460. As a matter of fact, that is your Bible study. Right? That's your Bible study for this evening. We're not going to have any. I'm going to let you meds on this thing this evening. I don't want to over overload you. This is your Bible study. Get the book on the app. Read it, friends, prayerfully. Council of and Food, page 373 to 416. The section entitled Flesh Meats. It will reprove. It will rebuke. But it will also encourage you. Friends, what then? May the Lord bless you and your family with good health and good eating habits as we await Christ's soon second advent. And let's not forget, go back to Enoch. Before he was translated, Paul says in Hebrews 11 that he had this testimony that he pleased God. Our desire 
says Ellen White, is to always seeking to find out what best pleased the Lord. And you know what pleased the Lord? One of the things that pleased him? When we eat the way which he wants us to eat, friends. That's why I do it. Because a plant-based diet, along with all the other laws, it pleased the Lord. And I want to be translated. We're told among, please read among those as I close. Not in your hand, but it's in your previous hand, right? Uh -huh. Among those who are waiting for the coming of the Lord. And friends, that, that waiting has an illusion to be translated. Here it is now. Meat eaten will eventually be done away. Sooner or later, it's going to have to see some of your plate. And I pray sooner than later. Flesh will cease to form a part of their diet. There it is, friends, right? We should ever keep this end in view and endeavor to work steadily toward it. Now, friends, again, run your own race. But, friends, it must, you must be working towards now getting yourself off, your children off, your husband off. A flesh diet and transition more to fruits, nuts, grains. You will never forget it. You will never regret it, pardon me. Right? Go ahead now. I cannot think that in the practice of flesh eating, we are in harmony with the light which God has been pleased to give us. Uh -huh. All who are connected with our health institutions, especially, should be educating themselves to subsist on fruits, grains, and vegetables. Friends, that is the word of the Lord. When we walk with the Lord... In the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still. And with all who will trust and obey, sing it now, trust and obey, for there's no other way. To be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sign or a tear, can abide while we trust and obey. All together, trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. can prove the delight of his love until all on the altar we lay for the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Loving Father in heaven, Lord, you are our Jehovah. We are in this wilderness, Lord, of sin. And we are trying to make our way to the heavenly Canaan. And Father, we have all come out of Egypt, but Egypt has not left us. And we still crave for those things which are forbidden. We still yearn, Lord, for things which are detrimental to our spiritual well-being. Oh Lord, you're a good father, and you only provide good gifts. And so on this Lord's Day, we want to recommit, rededicate. We give you our appetites, oh Lord. There are many who are watching now, Lord, who have been convicted by your spirit. And they must now make changes, Lord. But guide them, lead them, dear Father. Help them step by step to get off, to wean off a meat, dairy diet, and to transition fully, wholly, on a plant-based diet. And for those who have been on a plant-based diet for, for many years, maybe there are other laws which we are not 
been living up to, Lord. So we cannot cast the stone, Lord, because we're all in transgression. Help us, Lord, to bring those other laws into harmony with our diet. We know the whole creation groaneth. And Lord, it is now time for your people to take a firm stand against meeting. I pray, Lord, for the pastors, for the teachers, for the evangelists, for our leaders who lead out in our worldwide church, Lord, that they will make a commitment to you, Lord, based on for all you have done, to come off that flesh food diet and to subsist on a diet that would produce good thoughts and good bloods and pure characters and that will help us get ready for translation. This is our prayer because we ask these things in the name of Jesus and all God's people say, Amen and Amen.